I'm Nadia Vilchik, and every week I interview an individual or individuals who are making a difference. And today I'm delighted to be joined by three women who are certainly working on making a difference. And they are Deborah Riley Draper, who is an acclaimed award-winning filmmaker. Some of her work includes Olympic Pride, American Prejudice, Versailles 73. Then there's Alana Lark, a young filmmaker, also critically acclaimed, Sweet Auburn Blues and Made in America, and Lola Okunola, who is an artist and social media guru. So I'm joined by three exceptional women doing exceptional work. And I wanted to start with Deborah Riley Draper on, Deborah, you've been working on creating awareness and shifting consciousness since probably your most well-known, or let's say your work that first put you on the map, which was the size 73. Well, I, you know, for me, um, I'm most drawn to and most curious about the stories, the places, and the people that have been intentionally or unintentionally left out of the history books. Um, and this work is not necessarily, um, it started out for me because I wanted to understand who I am, where I come from, and, and the great um, important work that women of color, black women in particular, have contributed to America that was not recognized, elevated, amplified, or even considered. Um, and I also wanted to make it very clear that we've been here and we've been doing the work so that people don't have to fight for the same things that have already been bought for, so we don't have to hop on the hamster wheel and, and, and keep pedaling um, for that same fight. So Versailles 73, was about um, fashion, but it was also about the fact that in fashion, we never recognized that the birth of Pret-a-Porter or the birth of Ready to Wear is inextricably tied to the black models who went to France with Halston, with Oscar de la Renta, with Anne Klein, with Stephen Burroughs to literally unseat the French November 28th, 1973. And that included models like Pat Cleveland and Beth Ann Hardison. So they've not, at that time, they weren't given their fair shake. So I wanted to tell that story. And the same for Olympic pride. Um, obviously, we all know pre-World War II history, and, and we know the 1936 Olympics, and we know Hitler, but we didn't know that there were 18 African Americans, including two Black women, Tidy Pickett and Louise Stokes, who faced down Jim Crow and Adolf Hitler to compete at the 1936 Olympics. Obviously, this is critically important in global history, American history, and this documentary, which became a book, um, a 400 page book after the film tells us that story and it helps us understand Jim Crow, helps us understand racism, fascism, oppression, um, marginalization, gender, colorism, racism against the context of one of the greatest sports events in history that no one knew all of these black people were actually there. It wasn't just Jesse Owens, there were 17 others. So I think it's important um, in our work that we tell the whole story, that we get to tell our own stories. We tell it authentically. We do the research. We ex excavate the truth. We use first um, party data, you know, primary source materials, and, and we do it for ourselves. But that gift is for everyone because you want to understand the truth of the world that you live in. So just one question. I mean, in terms of 1936, you wrote about Olympic pride and American prejudice, it's 2020. In your opinion, is American prejudice as bad as it was in 1936? Well, I think the, the parallels between 1936 and 2020 are astonishing. 1936 was actually an election year as well. Uh, 1936 had one man who was a dictator in a country that wanted to eradicate other people. And propaganda was used in a way that much like Twitter is used today. Um, so the propaganda films of 1936 and the huge push toward nationalism, very, very much a part of the politics we see in 2020. Um, I think what's the same is the need for a dominant narrative to suppress and marginalize the other narratives. I think that's the same. I think what's different 
um, is the embodiment of power of people of color and other people to realize that our world and our country will not survive if we continue to marginalize people, if we continue to live in a world without equity and equality, the world itself just won't survive. And that I think people are finally realizing that if you oppress one of us, you oppress all of us, and the whole system's gonna topple at some point. So well said. Alana, your work, tell us about your work and your desire to raise consciousness. Absolutely. Um, I agree with a lot of things you said, Deborah, about needing to be the tellers of our own stories. I think that we, especially Black women, have strong voices and, and the power to make sure that we don't go unheard. And one thing that's interesting for every project I've ever done from Sweet Auburn Blues, which was about the richest Black neighborhood in North America that's now facing gentrification, to Made in America that was about a Salvadorian mother who just came to America to try to find a better life for herself. Um, they're all about true stories that the reason that I told them at the time that I did is because of what was happening in the world. And I think the world tells you what stories need to be heard. So when children were being held in cages and they still are, we said, all right, let's tell the story about what could happen if we treated everyone the same in America. Um, and and show people the humanity of little babies and how they should be free to grow up and become successful. And um, the same can be said for Sweet Auburn Blues, which, you know, is the street where Martin Luther King grew up, it's where so many things happen that have laid the groundwork for um, Black liberation in America. And, you know, we're starting to see a lot of the, the property that we own be sold to other communities, which is, it's fine as long as we still maintain some ownership and make sure that people know what the history and the sacredness of that land is. Um, and so now I'm moving on to tell the story of what's happening right now, something called Black in America 2020. And we're going to the protests and we're talking to the protesters and we're, we're capturing the essence of everything that's happening because this is history being made. And, you know, I want to be part of making sure that we remember what's happening. So I really wanted to have the discussion with three accomplished women, three women who I admire, whose work is remarkable. And I wanted Lola's response about being a mother of two boys who are now, tell us Lola, and what this period has been like for you. And I really wanted to give a face to maybe people who hear about the unrest, they hear about the divisiveness, there is concern, but I wanted to give it a different face today from people who are deeply impacted by what's been going on. So I have two sons, um, one is 12 and the other will be 10 in a few days. And as you mentioned earlier, um, I am from Africa. I was born and raised here in America, but I was born to um, Nigerian immigrants. And um, when I was 10, I moved to Nigeria for about seven years. And then I came back for college, my master's and all of that. Now, um, my children, their first few years were in Africa. So they didn't actually no they were never referred to as black and so when we moved back my oldest son uh was eight and my youngest was six um their first week in school they asked me mom why are people calling us black <laughs> we're not black i said well yes you are and my oldest who's fair says i'm not black i'm peach you know, and then my other one goes, I'm chocolate, you know, I'm like milk chocolate. And I, at that point, I realized, oh, my God, wow, like, I really need to sit them down. You know, we're, we're back in America, they need to understand. Now, unfortunately, I've had to tell them even more than just what their color is. I've had to tell them when we go into a store, you know, make sure your hands are 
you know, everyone can see them. Don't touch things that you don't need to touch. Don't take in things we bought in another store into this store so they don't think that we stole it from, from here. Um, and, you know, my greatest fear was, oh, my God, I hope they don't experience racism in school, particularly in the last three years where things have just gotten really worse, in my opinion, in America. Um, and sure enough, this year, the worst happened. Someone called my youngest son the N-word in school. And, um, you know, that was painful um, because, you know, my son just didn't understand. Why? why what, what does that mean? Why did he call me that? And so we've just, you know, had to explain to them that, you know, we're different, but we're equal. You know, some may not see us as equal, but we are. And we will educate people and we will help people to understand that, you know, no one is better than the other. God created us all. And so I'm, I'm grateful that the first few years for them was in a place where they didn't, they didn't know. They felt like, you know, hey, there was no one above me. So they, they have that confidence now. You know, even if someone calls them something or treats them differently, which, you know, we have seen, they, they see it as it's their problem, not, not my problem. It's and that's really why I wanted to have this conversation. And it's a difficult conversation in some ways to have because people find, as we've discovered, discussing race and identity and differences difficult. Mm -hmm. But Deborah, for you, I mean, right now, first of all, I'd like to know how you have felt as a person who tells stories, how you have felt over the last few weeks. And then what is the way forward? How do we change the narrative? You know, um, I can't answer how I felt because I'm, I'm actually over answering that question, honestly. Um, you know, everyone's asking people of color how they feel um i think it's i think it's rhetorical right mm -hmm. what if, should we be asking I, I i think you should be asking what can we do right right um, not, I, I don't thank how, you how i feel right now is how i hope everyone on this planet feels hurt stressed confused horrified thank all, you all of that so notwithstanding all of the emotions I have, which I'm actually still processing. So I can't really articulate an answer that's thorough mm -hmm. or even um, totally thoughtful because I'm, I'm still processing. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be asked how I'm feeling. You want to ask, what, what do we do to change consciousness? Thank you, Deborah. I <laughs> want you to ask what actionable steps mm -hmm. can I take yeah. in this situation and to mean it. I think that is so valid is seeing people beyond a cardboard cutout, seeing people beyond a type. I think, I think in media, we, we need to stop and listen, not to the questions we're asking, but listen to what people are already saying and mm -hmm. what they've already said and, and take some time to understand why they've said it, what they've said, why they said it and what it actually means. So that there's not just listening, but there's also comprehension. And then that helps people determine what is the appropriate behavior. Um, I think that's the place to start. I think allowing voices that want to be heard at this time to be heard, but, but not just giving a platform for platform's sake, but having a purpose to why. And I, and I think we are there at this point where everything has to have intentionality. There has to be intention behind it um, and, and strategic thought to help move it forward. So being able to help people understand what racism is, what discrimination is, what that looks like in the workplace. Lots of people don't understand microaggression. They're going to go to work tomorrow and they're going to do something that's going to be utterly offensive and steeped in microaggression and not recognize it. So there needs to be a broad based education. So people who have an outlet, let's begin to bring on people who can educate everyone around what racism looks like, how to detect it. And when you see it, how to tell a husband, a wife, a friend, a sister, a brother, a child, a coworker, a minister, 
the guy at Starbucks that you have just behaved in a manner that suggests that you don't understand what racism is. Because if you did, you would not have performed that act. So it's interesting. I mean, for people, you are a highly acclaimed global filmmaker, but you also have been in the advertising world and in the corporate world. So I'm curious, Deborah, when you look back at your multifaceted career, what would you have liked to have said people to people that you worked with? And did you ever? You know, um, early in my advertising career, I didn't say anything. I saw all kinds of ugly things happen and I didn't say anything because I didn't want to lose my job and I wanted to get promoted. And, I, and, and so I was afraid to actually speak. And um, so e even in casting decisions, even in campaign decisions themselves, I was, I had to grow into being comfortable to speak. And sometimes when you are the only black woman in a room filled with white male creatives, it is an intimidating thing. And then when you grow into speaking, you know, you, you, you have to be careful because then you're falling into the traps that are made not that you created, but are you angry? Are you intimidating? Are you, do you only have a, a, a scope that contains black culture? Are you global enough? Are you broad enough? So you have all of these things working against you that people don't even realize are working against you that they're actually putting against you. So, so what, what advice now would you give to young black women who are in the corporate world, who are experiencing microaggressions, how does one deal? How do you handle them? And I give the advice to first, not to the black women, but to the HR departments and the hiring departments to make sure. Please, that, please. I'm not, I'm, I don't want to put the work on the young black women. Again. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that's why I wanted to have this conversation because we are learning as you are speaking. And what would you like to say to the HR departments? I don't want, I don't want the young 24 year old black girl to have to do the work. Got it. I want the HR person at the corporation to recognize microaggression exists. Mm -hmm. You know, racism and discrimination exists and people come to work with a bias mm -hmm. and, and to root out and spot the people that are doing that and either retrain them or get rid of them and find ways to have open, honest conversations about microaggression in the workplace. I don't want to put that on a kid that just graduated from college. When talking and about that would be you, Alana. <laughs> I know, that's why I'm over here like, yes. Like, yes, <laughs> yes. Have you even graduated yet? You're, you're still studying, right? I graduated from Georgia State in 2017. Yes, exactly. I but so, I worked there, so that might be why you um, thought that, Nadia. But for you, I mean, what Deborah is saying, thoughts around that, reactions to that. Yeah, so I think I'm at the point where the work um, in battling racism is is literally my job. Like as a black storyteller, I do this for a living and for the lives of my black and my black sisters and brothers who are dying. You know, we know what's happening, and so it comes down to I really would like to see my white counterparts doing more work. Um, because I already do it so much. And I feel like, you know, a lot of what Deborah's saying is because, you know, we, un we have an understanding of being black in America is already just a lot of work. Um, and so we're calling on non-black people who say they care about black lives to stand up and do something to show us that um, and to get uncomfortable and to, you know, do the research and not, DM me to say, hi, how can I help? The, the resources are out there for you. And I'm not your one-on-one, -on -one, um, like how to help black people person, even though everything that I represent, you would think that I am. Um, I say, stream more content by black creators, read more black books, read more articles by black people. These are all the things that I want people to do, but I want them to do it on their own. I want them to do the work. Thank you, Lola. Your thoughts? I agree totally. Um, I, Deborah, just you know, to piggyback off of what you said, the training. Um, I would just want to add that whatever it is that we do, the training and the awareness, it has to be sustainable. 
Um, I noticed that, you know, there are people that are trying, I think, you know, to learn more about Black people and try to adjust the way they behave. But I hope it lasts. You know, I really do. I hope this is not just a season. I hope that this is really sustainable. Um, that's just my only worry. How, how do we make sure that that is sustainable? And then in addition to that, I do think that, you know, some people, white people, think that certain Black people experience racism. But I, I really think wow. that they need to know that all black people experience racism. High class, low class, middle class, living in Buckhead, living in Manhattan, all of us that are black experience racism. I think what Lola said is probably the best thing I've heard all week, just all week, because I think people do put a lens on it and, 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 and they have a certain idea of who experiences racism or who is subject to racism or, and, and I think it needs to be very clear in the way that you just stated it all. And, you know, looking at the three of you, you look at these incredibly highly acclaimed award-winning women and Lola, you know, I work with Lola. I never even think, I can't say you don't see color because I always think that's, what does that really mean? But it's getting to know someone beyond who they are. And that's really what you've said in terms of this conversation is so powerful. And do we do that as individuals? That's important. So the question remains, and Alana, you said it, you know, what are, what are you reading? So let's start with Olympic Pride, American Prejudice. It's a good story to read. Have any of you read The Warmth of Other Suns? A worthwhile read. Um, everybody's talking about this book, White Fragility. Don't know how many of you have read it. If it's worth reading, you know, this woman does all these seminars where she talks to a group of white kids and she says to them, how many of you would like to be treated by a black, a black person? And apparently it's raising a lot of consciousness. Again, the, the goal of my conversation with the three of you today was to do exactly what we've said. It's to go beyond seeing what we see and say, who are you? And go beyond also reading what we should do and hearing it and hearing it from you. You know, as a South African, I grew up in apartheid South Africa. I watched legalized discrimination. I watched people being hoarded into buses during the pass laws. I also happened to be in South Africa during the end of apartheid, which was an incredibly euphoric time. 1990, Mandela was released. 1994, the first ever democratic election. But prejudice is so deep seated in our psyche when you grow up in an unequal society. So it's, it's a difficult, I find this a very difficult conversation as a white South African. I, I am uncomfortable with it. I find it a difficult conversation to have. I would much rather be having dinner and cocktails with the three of you and not be talking about this. You know, I'd rather be talking about the movie and fashion and everything else. It is uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. um, but Lola and I had lots of discussions about it's uncomfortable, but it is important. And to your point, the question is, what do we do? So I would be grateful if we could continue this conversation. I think the four of us need our own version of The View. <laughs> right? Because then we can keep it broad. I mean, you know, we can discuss a lot of different topics. A couple of things that have come to mind during this discussion, I'd really like to hand it over to you because all three of you have so much to say. I mean, Will Smith recently came out with, or maybe it wasn't so recent, he said, what are you all supposed surprised about? Racism is, has always existed. It's just being filmed now. You know, and the reality is the onus on us as individuals, each of the four of us have a platform. That is the truth. We all have people who we persuade and influence. And if we can, in our own small way, big way, help people understand, go beyond, I mean, Lola, what you've just said, you know, people experience it. As a middle-aged white woman, I can go to any bathroom in any city and I can walk into a hotel and I can say, can I use the bathroom? And I will be let through. And I am aware that by nature and this, 
I never get questioned. I would assume neither the three of you would either. But what Lola's saying- You wouldn't assume that. I can't I assume. Would have, I would be ready to pay for something at that store or hotel in case they say it is only for patrons. Ditto. I, I've actually went ahead to pay before they even <laughs> said it. So I would buy something and then go to the bathroom so I could have the bag with me. <laughs> On the way to the bathroom so yeah no yeah i mean that's you know i, I once went on on it was buford highway and it was a scrubbing place i don't know if you know about these scrubbing places and i walked into the store afterwards and the woman looked at me and she said nothing here fit you and i could clearly see i mean it was and it was such a shock to me and i said so what about the flip-flops and she said no they're too expensive and it was so surprising to me that somebody wouldn't treat me and, and you know she said and then she told me I was too big for everything and and it was but it was a moment for me where I remember thinking that is just something that I have never experienced because particularly as a white South African there was just tremendous privilege I like to think that South Africa is one of the most remarkable democracies in the world I have had the pleasure of working with the Mandela family and thank God for Nelson Mandela, but does racism exist? Is it alive and well in people's psyches? And what do we do? And thank you for this conversation because have we solved the world problems? Probably not, but has something that each of you have said, and I'm gonna ask you to share a parting word, touched somebody in some way to look at something differently? So Deborah, for you, just last thoughts on what is not the easiest conversation. Well, I mean, I applaud you for admitting um, that it's uncomfortable and you'd rather have a glass of wine. And, you know, there's so many great restaurants we can go to in Atlanta and have a great time. But um, I think this was really important to begin to have conversations. And maybe what people can take from seeing the four of us is just that. Start having the tough conversations. Stop trying to push it, make it go away, turn the channel, not look at it. We have to just rip the Band-Aid off and start there. And certainly read books, read my book, watch my films. Yes. But if you don't, that's okay. Sit down with someone who is not from your neighborhood, not from your race, and ask them, where did you come from? What's your family background? Not how, not how you're feeling, but tell me about who you are and how you got to this place in this time. And, and, and by the way, Olympic Pride, American Prejudice is available as a film on? It's available on Amazon. Um, it's available on iTunes, Google Play, Versailles. They're all available for people who want to check it out. They can go to coffeebluffpictures.com and, and the list of the streamers are right there, but coffeebluffpictures.com and, and spend some time with uh, black history, with brown history, with history in general, so that we can understand how all of us got to this place. Because each of us bring a history and a culture and an experience. I can only talk about my lived experience or the lived experiences of the people in my family because that is what I know most authentically. Um, and if we all start having these open dialogues about what we know most authentically and not what we assume is most authentic about someone else, but your own lived experience, then we can have a more robust, honest, open conversation. Thank you, Deborah Riley Draper. Alana Lark. Um, thank you, Nadia. I think my main thing that has been bothering me is that a lot of people are very critical of protesters and the way that they protest. And um, while I never condone violence, um, I think Mandela is a great example of a leader who saw when peace wasn't working and disruption had to happen, that's just what had to happen. And I urge people who are so critical of these protesters to ask themselves, um, what, what else could they do? And, and are you doing that? And if not, then are you really, um, are you really able to cr criticize people who are just doing the best that they can to try to fight for the lives of, of people who've lost their lives to racism in America. 
Um, and that's another example of when it's good to look at history in order to learn how we should move forward. Um, that is a very valuable thing. For full disclosure, Alana is also the daughter of my very good friend and uh, CNN colleague, Brenda Bush. So I always commend her for remarkable children. Oh, that's very <laughs> sweet. She's going to be... Any last thoughts from you? Um, sure. So I agree with Deborah. We have to have these uncomfortable conversations. Let's step out of our comfort zone. Um, you know, don't worry about us. We want you to ask us, you know, um, I, and to um, Alana's point, someone, I, I listened to something this morning about protesters, people that are talking more about people that are protesting and not what they're protesting about and looting. And the way he described it, I thought was amazing. He said, it is like, a father yelling at his child and first and the child is trying to explain to his dad i didn't do it i didn't do it. and the father keeps saying hush your mouth be quiet go to your room and because the father has authority over that child the child cannot argue the child cannot fight back but then the child goes upstairs and starts tearing up his room because he's so angry in hopes that you will come in and see how angry he is and I thought, that's it. That's what's happening. And maybe if people hear that kind of story, they'll understand. It's not that people just want to loot, but they have gone unheard for so long that they're finally like, to hell with it. We're going to do whatever it is to get your attention. So I would love to stop hearing people talk about that part and focus on why they're doing it. Well, thank you all. And I do want to thank you, Lola. Lola encouraged me to have this conversation. She said, Nadia, you, you know, you have a big following, you have a platform, have the conversation. Thoughts from you, Deborah? Well, well I'm just going to say have a good evening and thank you all um, for allowing me to be on this platform with you. So, Oh, Deborah. Deborah is a masterful maker. So as is Alana and Lola I hope next time you get to show us some of your art. And just thank you all. Thank you for sharing your thoughts, your perspectives, and for going beyond just the cardboard cutout. Who are you and what do you think? And hopefully we can continue the dialogue and in our own small and big ways change the narrative because, you know, Viktor Frankl was a Holocaust survivor and Viktor Frankl speaks about this, between stimulus and response, there lies a pause and in that pause lies your power to choose and right now we have the power to choose how we respond how we think and how we influence others so thank you all so much <laughs>